All right, I already got started on this end of this uh, supersonic. I didn't show that because I could just flip the board up uh, like this, and I was working at, at an angle. There's no real way to film that. I've changed these out just the same way you see in other uh, Fender videos. Time to get started on the preamp. Uh, before I do, I wanted to point out something. If you are working on your own amp, which I don't typically recommend, but some people are, are able to do it, or you're just getting started and working in amps, something that's very important is after I made this big change here, I tested it. I didn't go and do everything. I tested after I'd done one substantial section to make sure they had not introduced any problems here. Because if you make all the changes to an amp, and then you test and you have a problem, you don't know when the problem was introduced. So I tested this, you know, powered it all up, verified everything was working before I moved on to the rest. And then I discharged everything so I can work in here and get my fingers in here and, and not get zapped. Uh, that's an important step. Once you power it up, you have to discharge it again. Anyway, let me show you one thing before we get started on the preamp. Hopefully this will uh, be visible easily to the camera. Let me, sorry, move them. Get this quick connect disconnected, this yellow wire. And let's look at this other yellow quick connect. This yellow wire is really stiff. And uh, this other quick connect is half, almost snapped off. It is partially snapped off. Let's see if the whole thing comes out together. Yep, there it goes, it broke. They had that thing wedged in there and it was just way too much force for that little connection. So I've got little quarter inch quick connects. I'll put a new one on there, but uh, that was easily avoidable. You have to leave enough slack to work on. You have to, should have had a, a bit of excess slack like that for strain relief. Instead, it was right there at the junction and it did what any mechanical engineer or anyone who's ever fixed a bicycle really, you don't have to have a degree to say that's a bad idea. <sighs> that was probably causing some intermittency, depending on vibration and stuff, because it was just hanging on by a, a few atoms. Anyway, let me start snipping uh, all the various cable ties and disconnecting ribbon cables and such. All right, as you can see, I've already removed the big axials and uh, the, most of the silicone that was holding them on. Uh, it's time to flip this board up and look underneath. Right here in this area, these two big 5-watt uh, cement resistors, these 5-watt diodes, these caps. This is the exact same circuit, though with the values changed, that's used in the uh, uh, Hot Rod and Blue series, and that always burns the board. And these diodes, uh, at least the, the solder connections, have show sign of heating. So we're about to check the underneath of this board. All these amps inherited this circuit, for, as far as I can tell, from the Evil Twin from 93, 94, and... Uh, it was a very brute force way of getting a bipolar low voltage supply. There are so many better ways to do this that don't generate heat, that don't need as many components, that could be mounted just you know to a spot on the chassis out of the way and used for various models and just uh, adjusted for different voltages as necessary. Uh, Fender doesn't do that. Uh, that would require rethinking a fundamental part of their amps. And they just do this brute force thing that burns. Let's see how badly this model is affected. All right, not as badly as commonly happens on the hot rods. You can see some darkening of the board here. These have gotten too hot, both by the discoloration and the uh, grayed out solder joints. These would have been shiny originally. How badly this circuit behaves and how much heat damage it causes depends on how much voltage it's being asked to drop. On some models, like apparently this or the uh, Blues DeVille, it's not being asked to drop as much uh, voltage so uh, it's not converting as much uh, excess voltage to heat. Let's just say that. I know it's not technically the right what's actually happening, but uh, if someone wants to read white papers, they're welcome to. But uh, on some models, like the Hot Rod DeVille, and I believe the Evil Twin and the Hot Rod Deluxe, it's being asked to drop a lot more voltage because the uh, transformer secondary is providing a much higher uh, AC voltage than is necessary for the DC. And so you get, you know, all that extra voltage has to go into some other form of energy and it changes into heat. So while this is not perfect, it's not a crippling thing, but all these are gonna get replaced because they have been toasty in their life. So I'm gonna start by uh, removing uh, these caps, these diodes. I think I've got some replacements for these resistors. 
we we'll to start with these six here, and then we'll move on to the rest of this stuff. All right, here you can see I've got all the components out. The pads are undamaged, aside from the heat damage that was already there. All the old flux is off. It's all cleaned, ready for new components. Same for the other side. Uh, this one had lost its top pad. Um, the others would, have been far, would not have been far behind, at which point the heat would build up so much to, till the bottom pads also lost their connections. Fortunately, um, it's the bottom pad which is actually connected to the trace. So this is regrettable, but okay. I also removed the solder from these two three watts. These are great components that someone had applied badly, and you, you could see in the previous video that they were all nasty looking at their solder joints and a lot of, of burn flux and stuff. So I undid them and reconnected them and cleaned them all up. We rebuild this section, then we'll move on. Okay, much better. Notice the new Zener diodes and 5 watt components are elevated up off the board, both so there's some air gap around them for better cooling, and because with the longer leads on the components, more heat will dissipate through the lead before it reaches the trace, so the trace won't get as hot to begin with. And uh, some really nice 105 degree Nishikon caps here. I think they're ready for 10,000 hours. They should last a really long time. And as much as feasible, I moved this Zener away from this cap just because it will generate a bit of heat and it's nice, even with a 105 degree cap. I can move this a little bit more this way, make sure we don't get a, any chance of these contacting these. Move that there by a little more space. It's okay if the two diodes interact with each other. There's enough air there, but we don't want any of these components baking this cap. The old caps were probably fine, but they'd been they had so many solder burns from people doing bad work in that area that while I was doing it, I think those caps were like a dollar each or less, so no big whoop. I'm gonna go over here and do some stuff in the bias supply uh, next, and then we'll turn our attention to the big filter caps, and I'm gonna look for any solder joints or anything that looks suspicious. I'm gonna peek at all the uh, the transistors to make sure there's nothing obvious that I'm missing before I button it back up. Onwards and upwards. Okay, down here got the new bias caps in place, all three of them. I disagreed with Fender. They had 100, 100 here, so they had a total of three because they're deriving it uh, from an AC tap through a capacitor. So I went with 47 instead of 100. Just gives it a little less of a charge time. Uh, I'd explain, but it takes too long. And down here we have four MOD 20 microfarad 500 volt caps. A little bit of silicone. It's not at the prettiest angle to see them from, but it's structurally good once that cures up. And let me go dig around and find my stash of uh, quarter-inch uh, quick connects so I can re uh, reuse that connection without having to solder it directly here, which is electronically even better, but makes future service difficult. So, All right, the board's back in place. Got the new quick connect soldered on. It's approaching at the right angle with enough slack. Won't be under strain in the future. Got all screwed back in place, ribbon cables reconnected. I'm not gonna rebundle all these wires with the, the twist ties, the zip ties yet. Sorry, not, not twist ties, zip ties, until I'm sure everything else is fine. I'm about to power it back up, but before I do, there's just all this sponge and extra flux on the preamp board. I'm just gonna give that a quick isopropyl cleaning and hit it with a little bit of a toothbrush. The one that I use only for this purpose unless you come to my house and spend the night and I really don't like you. Uh, in which case, this is your toothbrush. But before I fire it up, I want to give it the best possible chance to sound its sound good. And to look like, you know, someone's been in here doing work, who cares? Um, I don't expect this amp to be whisper quiet after doing all that work. Aside the fact that we still have a whole bunch of old tubes in here. The supersonic is a noisy circuit inherently. It's got a lot of design flaws. And so I expect there to be some remaining issues. But until all those caps were changed out, because it had a terrible, terrible ground, um, it just was saying it had bad filter caps. You can't hear minor issues if the whole amp wants to go hum. So uh, I'm gonna blot the worst of that off. Blotting, not wiping. If you wipe paper towels against solder pads with all the little component leads, you just end up with little bits of paper towel everywhere. But blotting, 
speeds up the process. Then I'll let this all evaporate and uh, we'll power it up. I put the power tubes back in place, but this may get another cleaning round after uh, I'm otherwise done with the amp. But if I need to change anything in the preamp, uh, you know, I start this process all over again. I know it's very exciting to watch someone clean on YouTube. I'm so glad we have this time together. But uh, it's just as important as, as uh, knowing how to do the complex stuff, as knowing how to do the basics right. All right, powering it on. I'm using my current limiter, my light bulb limiter, just in case something's wrong. Heard a nice reassuring relay click. And uh, let's check some voltages before I take it out of standby. This is an odd one in that the uh, standby is before the reservoir cap. I want to make sure we have negative voltage at both grids on the power amp to power tubes. Negative 52, negative 52. They're actually both negative 52.5, but who's counting? All right, I won't worry too much about that noise. Like I said, it has old tubes. Now with a design like this, where the pots are on the other side of this PCB, it's hard to clean the pots without taking everything out. So sometimes if you just work it back and forth a little bit, the noise goes away. But on the normal channel, that volume pot makes me suspect a bad preamp tube. So let me investigate that real quick. All right, I had sorted out some very, very bad preamp tubes in here. I had two really awful tubes made the amp oscillate and howl, and they had the wrong uh, uh, tube for the phase inverter. I've got a 12AT7 in there, which is correct. Uh, the amp is still much noisier than I would like. A lot of it is due to the way the effects loop is imp implemented. Someone in a previous video was asking what's the difference, difference between the effects loop in this and the preamp out and power amp in. Uh, this is really for slaving to another amp and it is an, a solid state op amp derived uh, splitter that is independent of this unless you were to run something out of this then into this. You could run effects there and you'd have no control over the level but it's low impedance output based on the, the uh, op amp circuitry. This loop uh, in some models is switch switch selectable and this one is not. Uh, some models also have reverb, this one does not. But it does give you independent control over send and return levels. Um, so you can use it with pedal based effects and stuff. But the end result of all this is a lot of additional noise that I think the amp could do without. But let me hear, let you hear what the amp is sounding like overall. <laughs> That's either Vibrolux or Basement, I don't remember. Here's the other one. Here's the burn channel, man. Which has a very high noise floor with the volume rolled off on the guitar. That may be some additional tubes Let me try a different tube in V1, see if that gets better. V1's not one of the ones I changed. Well, no, I tried V1 and V4. Those are the three triodes used by the burn channel. It just got a hum and buzz to probably sounds terrible through the lav mic anyway. I forgot to turn the lav mic down for that higher gain stuff, but um, you will definitely have heard the, the noise floor. So at this point, the amp is much healthier than it probably has been in a long, long time. And a lot of issues uh, are gone. And now it sounds like a Fender Supersonic, which definitely is a noisy build. So at this point, it's a matter of whether the owner wants it fixed, as in brought back to supersonic spec, or corrected, which means saying, supersonic did stupid stuff, like, are you using the effects loop? If not, let's ditch a lot of extraneous circuitry there. Um, let's look at some grounding paths and what's run on a trace versus what could be or should be uh, an isolated shielded run. But you know, again, how much money do you want to throw at a, uh, a Fender Supersonic that arrived in a pretty beat up head cap? So, you know, I think this is probably where this one will stop.